Hello, Booktube. I once again needed a break from the news first thing this morning. I know that technically I could have used a break from the news to experiment with my new technology. <laughs> I could have done that. I am supposed to eventually set time aside to do that, to change my whole filming routine from a 12-year-old laptop to a, a phone, an, a, an iPhone 11 Pro on a tripod with a microphone. I have all the technological pieces now assembled to do that. I just haven't set the time aside. I imagine I'm going to need about uh, one half hour that's really frustrating and one half hour after that that's not quite so frustrating. That's an hour, and I just haven't done it. I just haven't set that time aside. I haven't noticed many problems with the audio in the last few videos, so I just, I just haven't done it, and <laughs> I should, because it'd be nice to offload all filming to the phone. I mean, it's a better machine than this laptop, but instead, I felt like stretching my legs. I felt like going and talking with somebody in English as opposed to talking with the bean. So I uh, I went out to uh, an old friend who has uh, runs a church here in Boston, and we talked for a bit. I didn't I didn't overstay. I I wanted to be with Frida, so uh, I couldn't bring her along because you never know what's going to happen. You never know what's going to be there. I I thought it best to just leave her sleeping and go and do it on my own. So we had about as comforting a talk as we can get, considering the news that's going on in, in Gaza. Uh, and I got a ton of books <laughs> because he, he also, he gets book donations all the time from his parishioners. So there was a mountain of books there. There was also a mountain of other stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of revolving in my mind a plan for my little book room that may require a little easy chair. Not the huge uh, Donegal easy chair that's here in the living room, but a smaller, comfortable, but a, still a smaller easy chair. I'm revolving in my mind a plan that would involve such a thing. It, it, it's possible that someone would donate such a thing to him. I didn't see anything like that. Uh, but there were a ton of books, and they were all free. They were, he was just going to give them to me, you know, in a box. So uh, I grabbed as many of them as I could comfortably carry. I admit my heart wasn't completely in it. But now that I'm back here, I kind of wish that it had been, because <laughs> I could probably have taken twice as much. But I thought we'd go through what I found. Uh, not always in the best of condition, but, uh, you know, I'll be the last port of call for all of these things. The first one is The Curse of the Pharaohs uh, by Elizabeth Peters. This is an Amelia Peabody mystery uh, of a, a Victorian female archaeologist and her archaeologist husband. Uh, and I love this whole series. I just I, It starts with the crocodile on the sandbank and it just goes on from there. I'd forgotten. I always forget. When I, when I re-enter this world, whether it's in one of the earlier books or whether it's in some of the some of the later books have I know this is a pretty good cover but some of the later books have absolutely gorgeous covers the ape who guards the balance is just a beautiful beautiful cover and I always forget no matter where I jump in on this series how good a job Elizabeth Peters does at not making you feel like you're missing out on anything every every one of these books is not only very effectively self-contained but delightfully so Amelia Peabody, our narrator, loves to catch you up in her in her her tart, sardonic way on all of the stuff that you might have missed. And that's definitely true in this book, uh, which you know features seems to feature uh, the stereotypical curse of the pharaohs, a tomb that that curses the people who open it. Uh, th that would be distantly based on the curse of King Tut, which, of course, is not true. <laughs> there, first of all, A, there's no such thing as curses, but B, there isn't any statistically or actuarially outland outlandish thing about the fates of the people who were involved in opening King Tut's tomb. Uh, but this, this book has the added delight of featuring the Baskerville family. <laughs> but so it's just perfect for Victober. Uh, I forgot... I read, uh, I think, the first few chapters of this as soon as I, as soon as I got back here. I reread the first two chapters. I haven't read this since it, it first came out in 1981. Good Lord. Uh, I'd forgotten how much fun Elizabeth Peters has with these, how funny they, a lot of them are, a lot of the, the moments are. 
So uh, this, for those of you who date your Amelia Peabody books only by Young Ramses, <laughs> then you know who you are. You, if you're like everybody else who reads this series, you date them by Young Ramses, by their, their young son. Uh, he's just a baby uh, in this book. So uh, this, I'm going to have a great deal of fun rereading the whole of this. And probably, uh, I think I have all of these as ebooks. I probably, it'll probably just send me down a rabbit hole of reading a lot of them. Probably it will. But I like, uh, these things have had a million different redesigns. I really like this redesign. Uh, I When they were coming out, when the paperbacks were coming out like this, I, I got a lot of them. But uh, the design of some of the later ones, the hardcovers are so beautiful. The hippopotamus pool, the ape we are is the balance. Some of the, the later ones are just wonderful, just gorgeous things. Every time I find them in hardcover, I always kick myself when I get rid of them. I, I have many times on this channel. I've found them many times, and I always mail them out. And I shouldn't. I should keep them. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, that was that was first thing. Then uh, science fiction classic, The Snow Queen, Joan Vinge. This is uh, just a battered old mass market paperback this this won every award in the world it's a fantastic engrossing story about a world that's climate is about to change and its government is about to change it unless a central figure in fact two central figures who are not unambiguous heroes unless they can stop that time immemorial change from happening i haven't read this in a reread it in ages Actually, is this going to be the same thing? The 1980s and 1981. Maybe it's the same person. I got rid of both of these. Uh, I don't have it, I don't think, as an ebook. I don't have it in any other form. For a while, I had a uh, trade paperback with this uh, Michael Whelan cover artwork, this great cover artwork, but I don't think I have it anymore. I don't think I have a copy of this at all. So uh, so I grabbed it. Uh, it's, a, it's a battered mass market paperback, but, you know, no one's going to get it after me. I will read it, and this will be the form that it that it dies in. So, uh, then we have uh, four mass market paperbacks. These are in mostly perfect condition. I found one, and then set my friend and I set set off, you know, digging through boxes to find the other three because this is the the Raj Quartet by Paul Scott. These are four books, uh, and I found them all in relatively good condition. I mean, you don't you don't see these very often anymore. Uh, let's see here. We have book number one, The Jewel in the Crown. Uh, that will be the most familiar title to most of you, especially if you've seen the uh, the adaptation on TV. Then uh, let's see here. Book number two is The Day of the Scorpion. Uh, book number three is The Towers of Silence. And book number four is A Division of the Spoils. Uh, these are really, really good. These are really good historical novels about the British Raj. And I saw them. I have them as ebooks, and I also think I have this set in not in this good condition, but in mass market paperback. I've always periodically I get the big fat hardcover. Uh, always thinking that that's the format that I wanted in. I never keep it in that format because the hardcover is just too inconvenient to read. Slips out of its dust jacket, sprains the wrist, strains the lap. It's just, it's too inconvenient to read. I, if I found it, I would probably pass it up. One thing I wouldn't pass up would be a big UK trade paperback of that hardcover. I've never seen it, but I, I assume that it exists. I wouldn't pass that up if I saw it. But I saw these, and I, I grabbed them because I was thinking of Mark at Book Time with Elvis. I was feeling a little guilty for calling it Booktube's Lady Bracknell. So, so, uh, so I grabbed, you know, I grabbed the the ultimate. The thing that, that people don't realize about this series, especially since usually they read uh, uh, let's see here. Let's get them in order here. Usually when you see these things, in the four of them together, you see a battered condition copy of The Jewel in the Crown because people read that. Then they get halfway through The Day of the Scorpion and then they stop. And that's a terrible shame because this is a tremendous series of books. Just tremendously good. And tremendously involving, too. So uh, I grabbed it. If, I, if I'm wrong, I know that I have ebooks of them, but if I'm wrong about having another set, I'll be glad that I had this. It was certainly worth it for free just to put it in a box. Uh, then we have uh, Jamie O'Neill's book. I think this was his debut at Swim Two Boys. Uh, 
a strange historical novel about two boys who eventually fall into a kind of love at the beginning part of the 20th century. Uh, Irish history is brought into this thing wonderfully, intelligently. Uh, it, there's an emotional resonance that's all through this and is wonderful. But really, the thing that I always remember is the language. This is just such a beautifully written book. And again, I always have copies of this. When did this come out? Uh, 2001. I always have copies of this, and I always send them out. I always get rid of them. I've had a, on this channel, we've seen paperbacks, hardcovers. I think I got a UK hardcover, big green UK hardcover. I get rid of them all because this is just so good. It's just such, such a wraparound book in terms of both the story and the characterization, but especially the execution. This is beautifully written. Uh, so I grabbed it. <laughs> it was free. Uh, a little bit strange to find it in the, in the basement of a church, but still. Uh, then, uh, I don't know this edition at all. This is Joe Haldeman, the science fiction author, and this is his book, uh, The Long Habit of Living. Don't think I've ever seen this copy before. I think I've seen this book before, but never in this edition. Uh, this is New English Library. Uh, and this is, uh, let's see here. It is the 21st century, and life on Earth has been altered, not just by space travel, but also by the Stileman process. This complex medical miracle can quickly return an ailing body to youthfulness and health, and it can be repeated indefinitely every 10 or 12 years. The only catch is the cost. All the assets of the patient in question, which must be at least one million pounds sterling. Every 10 or 12 years, every one of the Stileman immortals must start again the process of making enough money to buy life or die swiftly and painfully. Thanks to the Stileman process, Dallas Barr is one of the oldest men on earth. He has also just become young again and is casting about for his next million pounds when he runs across Maria, a woman from a literally previous life, and realizes that all Stileman's immortals are not born or created alike, and that someone is trying to kill them all. I haven't read this thing in forever. Oh, when, when was this? Uh, when was this? 1989. Probably it was around then, in the early 90s is probably when I read this. And I've never seen this cover. So, I, I fates seem to be pushing me in the direction of Joe Haldeman lately, so I will definitely give this one a reread. Uh, then, of course, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't pass this up. I don't think... Uh, I don't think I ever reviewed this. This is a newer book. Uh, 2018. So we would have seen it on this channel in the advanced copy and in the finished copy. But I don't think I ever reviewed it, and I didn't keep it. But the, the events of this week, uh, those of you who are watching this video from, you know, 10 years in the future or whatever, uh, on the weekend, Hamas terrorists broke into Israel. They kidnapped a whole bunch of people. They brutally murdered and tortured and burned alive a whole bunch of people, old people, young people, babies, uh, and then retreated back into Gaza. And the Israel's right-wing government promised revenge, basically. They promised a gigantic campaign of revenge. Uh, Hamas is a terrorist group that is situated in and among a civilian population in Gaza. Uh, they have underground bunkers and command and control centers of their own, but it's all deeply interwoven with the ordinary people jam-packed in the Gaza Strip. And Israel started bombarding Gaza from sea and, and air strafing and whatnot, just bombarding and whole apartment blocks coming down with the innocent people trapped in the jaws of this thing. I mean, the grandmothers and little kids and teenagers who had just enough of a, a life online on their phones to know what they were missing. They, they, you know, a 14 year old boy living in Gaza knew perfectly well from his phone that he was, that he got a real raw deal from random luck and was living in the worst place in the world. Now, uh, that bombardment, which has just gone on for the whole week, it's just it's just gone on, now that bombardment is being followed up with a, a ground invasion, a ground assault. So this will be ground troops, this will be tanks and armored vehicles, going street by street, block by block, building by, by building. Uh, you may have, well, if you're watching this future, then this will all be settled one way or another. I think I know the way it will be settled. But the news right right now, the news that everyone's talking about, is that Israel gave the residents of Gaza, of northern Gaza, a 24-hour warning to evacuate. Not 
to evacuate a particular building or a particular block, but to evacuate northern Gaza. <laughs> when Israel's on bombardment has made hundreds of thousands of patients who can't move. And could you? <laughs> could Even if you weren't injured, could you up and move? They, uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, out of the 1.1 million people who live there are not able to evacuate. So they are simply going to be there when Israeli troops start exchanging live fire and mortar rounds with Hamas in their streets. Uh, to, when that news was unfolding, it's been unfolding all week, so the reason that I went to talk to my friend to just get away, to talk to someone, when that news was unfolding, I was naturally I've been bombarded by a, a lots and lots of people who asked me for reading recommendations. But I've also been thinking about books that I've read on the subject, and one that kept coming up over and over again, I looked for here, and I realized I didn't have it. And uh, as luck would have it, I found it uh, this morning. It's the Wall and the Gate: Israel, Palestine, and the Legal Battle for Human Rights by uh, Michael Safard. Um, from 2018. We must have seen this on this channel. I would certainly have gotten it, but uh, I found it again. It's the one that I want to reread, uh, as grim as that's going to be, so of course I grabbed it uh, for free. Uh, and then the last thing is this beautiful Viking. Somebody, this Viking volume, I've had this many, many times, many trade paperbacks and hardcovers. Uh, and somebody put a nice library covering over this thing, so I will try my best to hold on to this one. This is Robin Lane Fox, who has a new book out, Homer and his Iliad. Uh, this is his book, The Unauthorized Version, which is basically a, his tour through uh, the New Testament, looking at textual problems, looking at, uh, at provenance problems, but also literal textual problems. What is the action being described here? Does it make any sense? Is it not right? Is it wrong historically? Like uh, uh, the uh, Pontius Pilate adhering to an age-old custom of releasing one capital condemned prisoner to the mob at their at their acclamation. No such, <laughs> there was no such custom. Uh, uh, or, or uh, you know, that's at the end of the Gospels. Or go all the way to the beginning of the Gospels. Uh, Caesar Augustus calling for a, a, a census in which everyone in Judea has to go back to the the their ancestral homeland. Of course, there was no such thing at all. And here, Robin Lane Fox goes through all of that. It goes through the, the text. It's really, really good. Really smart. I love the book. I just, I don't know why I keep getting rid of it. Maybe I'll hold on to this one. Uh, especially since it's in such nice condition. I don't remember ever seeing a, a version that looks quite like this. So, uh, so I grabbed it. This, I do understand why I would see it in the basement of a church. But it's going to have a home here. I'll give it a reread. Uh, and that was it. A weird mixed bag of uh, just a, a random book haul. So we have, uh, we have the unauthorized version, a really nice clean edition. We have uh, The Wall and the Gate. I'm very much looking forward to rereading this. I'll do that tonight. Uh, we have The Long Habit of Living by Joe Haldeman, a Joe Haldeman novel that I do not typically see. Uh, I just recently got uh, at the used book superstore, I think is where I got uh, a an anthology of his of his th three of his famous books on military science fiction, but I never see this thing. I've never seen this paperback. Uh, we have At Swim Two Boys uh, needs no introduction. I'm sure it's a very po was a very popular book, uh, and then a bunch of mass markets. We have The Snow Queen by Joan Vinge, probably her greatest book. We have The Curse of the Pharaohs by Elizabeth Peters, probably going to set me off on a Victober reread of the whole of Amelia Peabody. What could be better? Uh, and finally. Uh, uh, the Raj Quartet by Paul Scott. So we have The Jewel in the Crown. Uh, we have The Day of the Scorpion. We have uh, The Towers of Silence. And we have A Division of the Spoils. And these are, it's, it's uh, like I say, it's a shame. It's a little bit of an ironic shame that people who loved the miniseries uh or have heard about these things, never get very far in. That's It's a terrible shame. In this case, I do not blame the author. I ordinarily would. If if I have, I've lost count of how many copies of these things I've seen where the, the first book is well-thumbed, the second book is thumbed halfway, and the others are in pristine condition. I've lost track of how many times I've seen that. And ordinarily, I would blame the author. I would say, well, this is an overwritten book, then. This is overlong. That's the reason you're losing your audience. But I don't think it's... I don't think it's that. Because I've read it a few times, and I'm clearly sort of faded to read it again. 
and it doesn't flag. It is absolutely marvelous from beginning to end. So I, I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> Maybe it's just that people don't have the, the gumption that they once did as readers. <laughs> Anyway, uh, that's just an impromptu little mail haul. I really needed it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick around with the bean for a few days now. I felt a little bit bad leaving her. I could have brought her along, but that complicates things, and I'm not always sure that she is going to enjoy being brought along. She would enjoy being brought along if I could guarantee beyond a shadow of a doubt that she were the sole focus of my attention the whole time, and I couldn't guarantee that this time, so... It wasn't the same thing as a road trip to the book barn where I could guarantee it. But she wasn't traumatized. She was happy to see me back. That's all. And we are, I mean, she's almost seven, right? She acts like a puppy. She's, when you meet her, people are always astounded that she's that she's six years old. She doesn't act old at all. But we're not far off from her wanting to stay here and sleep in the sun and rather than come with me, of her wanting that. So that, sure, when I come back, she's upset because she then realizes that I was gone. But otherwise, no, she's not pining for me. I'm, on, I'm trying to put those days off as much as possible, but I will, I will pamper her with attention. So, so anyway, that's a, that's a book haul for you, out of the blue. Uh, there'll be more to come, I'm sure. I will go back to the brattle, especially since this big wadge of rain is canceled, apparently. So there's no reason why I shouldn't. Uh, I won't go to the brattle on the weekend, obviously, <laughs> but, but next week. So I'll wrap this up for now. Uh, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.